hard it now, so it's like the natural time to start. So cool. yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, as today is Jim Lagao, uh, who is assistant professor at Brock University uh, in it's cross appointed chemistry. Yeah. Engineer. Yeah. I mean, in the uh, chemistry <laughs> department. <laughs> yeah. been at Brock for a year and a half. Yeah. Um, before that, he was uh, in Taiwan University. Uh, yeah. Um, Clemenson. Sorry, yeah. Clemson, South Carolina. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you've done postdocs, uh, I see, at uh, NREL, so the National Renewable Energy Lab, mm -hmm. Los Alamos National Lab. As well as Berkeley, mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, the floor is here. Look forward to your cool. presentation. Cool. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for Ryan and John inviting me to give the talk. Uh, so, Mike Master is not new to me, and uh, my PhD advisor actually is a graduate student from Mike Master uh, Physics Engineer Program. <laughs> so. Uh, I also received a PhD from the University of Alberta and in physics. So uh, today I'm talking about ultra-fast carrier uh, in the proscite material. I don't know how much you guys knew the proscite material, and uh, anyone have an idea or heard about the proscite? Cool, easy for me. Uh, <laughs> So, so many people working on the proscite material, and it's been around like uh, around one decade. And the uh, proscite material, proscite solar cell, is already uh, on the market, the solar panel. So, many people jump in this crowd field. So, the main question is how we can make unique contribution in a new way. Is a good question. So hopefully today talk I can inspire you uh, to make a unique contribution rather than as a follower. Okay. So first I will int uh, introduce the history of a scientific instrument because the instrument is our eyes. Then the in scientific instrument we can use the scientific instrument we can discover new things like a new material, new property, new physics. And then leading to the evolution of time reserve, the techniques of one type of instrument. And we, already, we have developed this unique ultra fast photocurrent spectrometer. And then I uh, talk about how we use this unique approach to understand the proscite quantum dots and the proscite solar cell. And the last, I will conclude our human being, the lifetime, you can see. History, evolution, evolution is all about the lifetime. As a human being, our lifetime is ultra, ultra fast. Okay. So, instrument play a major role in scientific research. And here is the evolution of laser spectroscopy. I think you may be familiar with uh, Donna Strickland, who is uh, uh, a PhD, uh, not PhD, uh, undergraduate student from engineer physics, right? So you can see the evolution of laser spectroscopy from the nonlinear optics uh, since the invention of the laser and triggered the Nobel Prize in 1981 and uh, till 2018. Couple generation working on laser and uh, ultra fast uh, high intensity laser leading to the LASIK and the laser machinery and pump probe approach scientific research. And I would like to point out that Zavell is the only uh, Egyptian scientist that received the Nobel Prize. He's the only uh, one in the Egyptian, yeah. Another example is microscope. So from the early beginning, the face contrast to see the clear or living cell transparent to TM, ICTM, I think most students are familiar with the laser microscopy. To the cryo EM, and take a look, the living cell in the cryo or low temperature, also a couple decades uh, effort. And uh, Eric uh, 
uh, fat stake, uh, he's a UC Berkeley professor. The funny thing about him is if he gave a lecture, he say a lot of F words <laughs> in the public, <laughs> a really unique person. So you can see four number price over there and a couple generation, the evolution of the, the uh, microscope. Another example is mice spectroscopy because everything has a weight, have a mice. Make sense for you, molecules, human beings, uh, bio, bio, uh, bio, uh, bio, uh, bio molecule uh, system, everything. So from the EM, from the J.J. Thompson, discovered the EM ratio to the, uh, to the MALDI, this is even you know, simple devices, like uh, uh, we call this ion trump, which is corn trump, corn, corn polar trump, trap received no price, simple devices. So you can see the instrument also involved the couple generations. One person I would like to point out is uh, 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 Koyuchi Tanaka, who is a Japanese guy. He's the few person who only has a bachelor degree received the Nobel Prize, okay? And uh, this is NMR, nuclear. Everything has magnetic, Property is intrinsic property. Everything has magnetic. Nucleus, electron, everything. So magnetic is a spin, is intrinsic property. And I, I see you know, that nowadays we use MRI to have the imaging, to take the tumor and to take the cancer imaging. It's a couple uh, generation, the evolution. And one person I want to point out is Ravi. Ravi, when he did his research, decided he work in the nuclear. He has a, Europe, a European tour with a couple big Nobel Prize people like Schrodinger, Pauli, and then he decided, oh, I want to jump in the nuclear magnetic field. So I want to deliver the message to you is two things. First, instrument is our eyes. Okay. Second, instrument can make a significant contribution, which demonstrated by the Nobel Prize. But this is not end of the world. I would imagine AMR still got Nobel Prize. Okay. There's another Nobel Prize about AMR. Really large molecules, biomolecules. Okay. That's the main challenge. So. I'm passionate about carrier dynamics or dynamics. And I think everyone knows you know, the uh, 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 motion, a horse motion, but it's visible. And uh, for instance, they have a speed of 15 meters per second, one meter, and this time scale is millisecond visible. But for the devices, for particular transistor, or for really thin film solar cell devices, the time scale, the thickness is really thin, and the time scale is less than nanosecond or is picosecond. This is a transistor. The moving from one side to another side is a picosecond. Okay, really fast. So, in the field of optical electronics the field, we're missing a really unique uh, uh, tools or technique or instrument which can identify the carrier dynamics in situ with ultra-fast time resolution. Anyone has the idea about in situ? Anyone? Who? Oh, no. <laughs> what is the ultra-fast time scale? Picosecond, we call it the ultra-fast time scale. Let me give you an example. What is the in situ. So white brother invented the flight of aircraft across North Carolina before many people tried. 1903 or no, 1907, okay? After that, uh, we want to shoot higher and move farther, okay? And uh, this is uh, ultrasonic craft. And after ultrasonic aircraft is the supersonic network. Okay. We want to move faster, faster, and higher and higher. But this is not the end. People, human beings want to 
fly ourselves. We want to be in that position. This is the in situ. Make sense for you? We want to be in that working condition. This is the meaning of in situ. Keep in mind this, okay? So for instance, a solar cell, we want to know the carrier transport in the real solar cell, okay? What is the ultra fast? So second, I think everyone knows the second, like a light, uh, uh, eyes blinking and fast uh, 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 camera, which is microsecond the camera, shutter camera. And the transistor move for the carrier moving is a picosecond. So from one second to one picosecond is wave order. Okay. The wave order. If you don't have the feeling about the wave order, I give you an example. So imagine one day you sit in the backyard, enjoy the sunshine, and you 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 sit in by a a, a honey honey uh, uh, you buy less uh, bean, okay, for one second. But you feel the pain 10 to 12 seconds. 12 order, right? 10 to 12 seconds is 1 million years. So technically, the transistor we moving in the computer, they are, they are a million years, okay? <laughs> Make sense for you? So we are on the same page, then. okay? Cool. And uh, but ultra fast play a major role in the solar cell. We'll talk about it. So I don't want to self uh, promotion myself. Uh, and uh, we I started my career after PhD graduate. Uh, I established this quantum dots solar cell chart. And nowadays is uh, already uh, nowadays is uh, uh, twenty percent already. It's just a solution precise the solar cell. And uh, the pros guide is ABX3 uh, cubic structure. A most of the time is uh, uh, A is cesium or inorganic, MA, FA, which is organic molecules, BX, which is light, uh, highlight based uh, chloride, bromide, iodine. So that's a really easy fabricated solution material. And uh, they Nowadays, they already achieve 26% of solar cell comparable with the silicon. Solution processed, okay? That's the reason many people jump in this field, okay? So, uh, about the solar cell, what is a solar cell? So you can see solar cell is a really simple device structure, which is just a PN junction shining the light to generate electricity, right? And the light shining it generate a carrier and cool down all thermalized to the bandage to get car current collected. Okay. However, it has limitation. The excited carrier thermalized to the bandage, they release a phonon or heat. Okay. One loss, transmission one loss, a photo emission generate a PL, another loss. So the final or the ultimate efficiency is 33%. Whatever your work, what kind of material work is maximum 33%. Okay. That's the limitation. So how we can make a solar cell higher than brick is a, a, a SQ limit. Shockley cross limits. Rather than we cooling down or thermalize to the bandage, we take the charge out, this the power efficiency is double. 66% is the same structure and the is P injunction. Okay. We call it hot carrier solar cell idea. Okay. And the people, you know, you try the multi junction and the different, you know, the band gap and put together also can achieve uh, roughly like 50% or something, but a really compli complicated device structure. Okay. But there is a problem. For this, you know, the, for, for the traditional semiconductor silicon, when I generated the carrier, they thermalize to the bandage. The called carrier, we call it hot carrier, excited state carrier, thermalized, before thermalized, hot carrier. The lifetime really short, picosecond. 
okay? For instance, so silicon under picosecond and the longer the bulk material, indium nitride, close to seven picosecond, it's still really short, right? So the idea is we want to look for a material system which has a longer hold current lifetime. So we have the time to steal the current out. Make sense for you? So what is it? Quantum dots. Because the quantum effect, the energy split, this correct. So when the hot carrier thermalize decay to the uh, band edge or conduction band or valence band, they emit a couple photons at one step. The possibility is lower, so the decay rate is slower. And for instance, silicon quantum dots, it increase a little bit for the MA light bromide prosigate is 32 picosecond or in light range a little bit longer, okay? And we call this effect is a phonon bottleneck effect. So make a comparison for the quantum dots or nanocrystal. If we are second flow, we want to take a stairs, slow down, okay? But you can also slide, let's say it's a bulk material, the lifetime decay faster. Make sense for you? So quantum dots is really unique system which can allow the hot carrier lifetime longer and we can make the hot carrier solar cells, okay? So to measure the hot carrier or to measure the carrier lifetime, let's take a look at the time result of the measurement or time result of the technique. I think uh, most of you guys knew the picture of the running horse, right? You don't know the this picture. He's the, Mr. Mybridge, he's the father of the fast motion picture. And uh, this is uh, his wife, dancing. He took the motion picture. He's the father of time resolved the instrument. First, the first person invented the fast shutter. But it's millisecond the time resolved uh, uh, measurement, okay? Uh, 1984, actually I'm missing one, I, I think, yeah. So 1984, the time resolution get any, uh, getting improved. This is from the Japanese company, uh, Horiba. This is time resolved the photoluminescence measurement, the resolution improved to 100 picosecond and so on, okay? The idea is extremely simple. 1984, we have the ultra-fast laser already. We're shining the molecules and the material pump, and we take a look at the photo emission, okay? That's how we measure the carrier lifetime. But this, the idea is this measurement is we open the time beam equally, same number, and we capture the photon's number. So this is a based on the statistics, this is really similar, like, uh, it doesn't show the, the animation. I want to show you the animation, okay? Yeah, it's running, cool. See, this is the statistics, okay? So they only measure the lifetime, they don't measure the, the efficiency. One photon comes in, how many photon comes out, okay? It's a statistics, okay, TRPL, time result of photoluminescence. So then, 1999, uh, Zavell, who is Egyptian, he's the father of photochemistry. He improved the time resolution to under the picosecond. So idea is a pump probe approach. Possibly some of you guys already heard about it. Actually, Zabel is not the father of pump probe. The father is 1967. I forget, you know, put over there, possibly show up later on. It's George Porter. He's the, he's the father of pump probe approach, okay? So the idea is really simple. If I have one laser beam ultra fast split pump and then probe, and we use the delayed, delayed stage, to delay laser two beam. The idea is the physics is we pump to, to any excited state. And then we use another probe beam to see the occupation states of the electron. Okay? If the electron already there, we can still further take out to excited state. If it's already over here, we don't absorb. Okay, over here. So 
from the second beam, pro beam, from the transmission or absorption, we can measure the lifetime. Make sense for you? But it's still a quanti quant not a quantitatively measurement. Okay. Yeah, optical measurement. Okay. Cool. I think uh, so. So, but there's a guide. All the measurement, all, all the technique, they are optical approach. They only see the photons, either the emission or absorption. Make sense for you? So the, in the real devices, which is a current, we don't see it. Okay. So, but the people try. People try. We, you, they have for this time of a flight experiment. The idea is the ultra fast the laser shining laser sandwich solar cell devices or any devices we generate for the current sweep to another side and collect as the photo current. The best resolution they can achieve is tens or or close to microsecond time resolution. Okay. So compared to pump probe optical measurement. There's almost three other differences we don't know. Okay. That's the missing guy. So the field are really looking for characterized uh, the material or devices in situ. Make sense? If I have a solar cell, I have a LED transistor, or any type of devices, we want to know the carrier transport a lifetime or how fast they move in situ. Okay. In working condition. And we collect the carrier as a current, and we understand the, the photophysics dynamics, right? So, if we go back to literature 1975, for more than half a century, and Austin invented a photoconductive switch, he achieved 300 picosecond time resolution. Okay, the photoconductive switch. Uh, Interesting, doesn't show up over there, but never mind, don't worry about it. So he has this photo current measurement with 300 picosecond time resolution. Our group, what we develop, we have, for instance, we have, we in, integrate a waveguide and with a photoconductive switch, we achieve for sub picosecond uh, uh, time resolution. The idea is we have any type of substrate, we have any material on the top, semiconductor material, and uh, we put into this transmission line uh, waveguide. Okay. And uh, we can achieve for sub picosecond, 10 picosecond time resolution. Because the photo current has the relation with the carrier population. The carrier mobility, so we can directly measure the mobility lifetime. It's it's already it's a time of decay measurement, right? So directly we can got the, the, the lifetime and we can got the mobility. Also, we can understand the photophysics dynamics. Okay. So that's the time. So we we also we use this uh, type of uh, instrument or technique. We can apply solar cell for detector, transistor, and LED. Actually, this is the real solar cell. I see I'm across the section uh, structure. Yeah. Uh, so in the solar cell, we don't have this tool with ultra fast time resolution to take a, a photo current out. Yeah. We don't. This is the main challenge in the field. So we also studied a bunch of material, quantum dots, 2 d layer, the organic semiconductor. Uh, so uh, here is our contribution to the field. Uh, so different material and the devices. Cool. Uh, so the idea is not coming from the air. So when I finish my PhD in Alberta, which is focused on the ultra fast the spectroscopy, uh, I moved to National Renewable Energy Laboratory and to focus on the quantum dots solar cell. And then, uh, so actually they are a, a, a company. Uh, he's a, he's a, now he's the CEO of a solar cell company. He asked me a question. Can you measure the uh, lifetime and the camera mobility when the, the solar cell works? We have this question. At uh, Los Alamos, uh, I develop uh, this technique or uh, instrument and uh, then moved to UC Berkeley 
Uh, so I, uh, uh, I, I have my own company, Berkeley Photonics, because I work at UC Berkeley. So, uh, but it's a shell company, it's, uh, but all, we, we applied for the grant, uh, and actually we got the money from the Department of Energy. But uh, because I moved to Canada, so I have to decline the grant, which is uh, SBR money, really prestigious industry money. So uh, we're trying to commercialize this instrument. And uh, because I moved to Canada, uh, 2017, uh, I was I so after I I do the work at uh, uh, UC Berkeley, I moved to Columbus in Physics Department as a professor. And uh, 2022, my family actually he they are here. So let's you know that I moved to Brock University in the Chemistry Department. So that's the the the, the growth or evolution of this unique technique. So. Uh, I wouldn't talk about you know the, what kind of question we address, but it's a really powerful technique to address many fundamental questions, including the different material, different devices, and the fundamental particle, including the uh, electron, uh, electron and holes and uh, the quasi particle like uh, phonon, isotone, polaron, as so on. Okay. Yeah. So the fundamental difference or unique feature is. Uh, why we need this <laughs> rather than technical uh, advantage? The other optical technique, pump probe approach or, or time result for the lumen, that's it. They only understand the diffusion dynamics. Diffusion, what is the diffusion dynamics? If you have a balloon in a really beautiful uh, 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 day and there's no wind, right? And, but your, your, your balloon, floating around the back and the forth. This is a diffusion, okay? If there is a wind coming in, this is a drift dynamics. Make sense for you? So in our case, we studied the drift dynamics in the solar cell, in LED, any type of devices, we have the external electrical field. Oh, the solar cell has built in, built in electrical field. It's drift dynamics. So whatever you shoot at the ball, I always coming down because the gravity is a drift field. Make sense? So that's the key. Okay. So we make the pros guide material, pros guide quantum dots. This is a, a really a, a solution per set the white chemistry uh, based on the, so I, again, it's ABX structure, cubic structure, uh, CISM, MAFA, and the light based, uh, highlight based uh, uh, material. And the thesis is actually really easy. They say it's a hot injection via the chemistry material uh, uh, thesis size. So we basically have a cesium precursor, and we have a light iodide precursor under the high concentration late nuclei. You can see the color change, which indicates the, the size grow, grow. Let's say from 10 nanometer to 15 nanometer. So this is kind of like quantum bubble tea. A uh, young person drink the bubble tea, right? So the quantum dots is exactly the same thing. It's just the bubble tea in small dots. And we use this bubble tea, we can spin coding and the solution process. You can make any devices you want. IOD, solar cell, okay. Biosensor, cool. And we can tune the different shape, okay. We can shape a different size, structure, anything we want, okay. And we basically tune the growth time, temperature, mass ratio for the ligand, uh, for the precursor or ligand. We can have a freedom of we can tune the structure size. Okay. Yeah. And actually, uh, the last year, last year, the Nobel Prize is quantum dots. Uh, and uh, uh, Louis Bruce is my academic grandfather. <laughs> my, my advisor, Paul Alessado, uh, he's a postdoc. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, let's come in zoom in the quantum dots, the carrier drift dynamics or diffusion dynamics. This is the major question in the quantum dots field. If we make the solution thin film, the dots dots connected, how far the carrier moving? Okay, this is the major question for the field. So, uh, to uh, early work, uh, which is done by my advisor, uh, in NREL, so he he pick up a different size, like a small size to larger size, cut a selenite, and he used the 
time result the pump probe terahertz measurement. Basically, it's a pump probe measurement under sub-picosecond time resolution. You can see here seems like this is larger data size, this is a smaller data size. The indication you can see, they can fit with a by exponential decay, the tau one and the tau two increase with the data size. Okay. So this indicate this is the plastic carrier transport, but it's just in one dose because the bird readings for the for the for the see here 25 bird readings for the kite selenide is 20, around 20 25 nanometer. So they just uh, bla uh, plastic uh, uh, plastic transport inside the quantum dose and stuck. Okay, they don't move outside. Okay. So that's the diffusion carrier transport. Okay. So what we do is we make this quantum dots array, okay, and we make devices under the electrical field, and we take a look at the ultra fast for the current. And here is the ultra fast for the current as a function of temperature. So you can see the 80k and the 300k. So 80k we have for basically the general trend we have. For uh, ultra fast rise and then fast decay and then slow decay. Okay, but the interesting thing is the for the eight k the peak is higher than the room temperature. You can see the trend the evolution. Okay, from the eight k to three eight k. So what I it indicate? Let's indicate the peak. Before it decay, is a plastic transport or band like a transport. Okay, because uh, I show you the, the 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 formula equations. Okay, but not the first decay and the second decay. The first decay the time and the second decay the time increase with the temperature. This indicate this is a thermally activated transport behavior. Make sense? But now they demonstrated a totally different behavior. The peak increase when the temperature decreases, but not for the, you know, the, the slow decay. Okay. So this which means beginning before the, the before the peak, the carrier for the current, oh, we can easily got mobility. They say it's a power law relation, negative power law relation with the temperature. They say it's the phonon scattering. Oh, they say it's a ballistic carrier transport. Okay. But for the fast decay and a little bit slow decay, we can fit with the heinous relation. They say it's a thermalization. A thermalization, thermal activity to transport. Okay, they say it's a defects dominated. Make sense? But beyond the light, the fundamental physics, we can calculate the drift length because we knew the mobility and we can have the carrier lifetime directly from the curve and we knew the electrical field, we can calculate the drift length, which cannot be done by the other pump probe approach. Okay, so we knew 50 nanometer, the each cube the proscate material or quantum dots, roughly 10 to 15. So we cross three or four if we apply the electrical field. Okay, this is really important for the solar cell people because they really, really want to know under the electrical field how far they move. Then they design the thickness and the structure. Okay. Okay, I think uh, this uh, uh, really familiar with many students familiar with. We also make a comparison with the galamus isonite and the silicon because they all inorganic uh, semiconductor. So what is the difference? For instance, this one is doped, slightly doped. We see the similar ultra fast for the current decay, but this is a silicon wafer or single crystalline. So the interesting thing is if we pay attention to the peak only, okay, you can see the same trend. When we increase the temperature, the photocurrent peak decreases. 
This demonstrated they share the common feature, which is the ballistic or band-like transport early beginning. Okay. And if we plot the photocurrent as a function of temperature, and we focus on the high temperature range, not the low temperature. Low temperature is due to the acoustic phonon scattering. The high temperature is due to the optical phonon scattering. We can calculate the index, the n number, t power minus n. We can derive the n number, OK? So we summarize over here for silicon galamus isonide, which is a traditional semiconductor. And also for the, for the other, uh, from the, you know, the, the result from other group, FA light iodide, uh, MA light iodide, we can plot this power law D, power law minus N relation, the N number. This is the N number. N larger than 1.5 is the benchmark for the optical phonons. Okay, if you do the, the, the condensed matter physics. And, uh, but for our system light iodide, we N number super high, 2.7, much higher than the other material. Okay, so why is light? So the N number indicate how strong this carrier interact with the phonon. If it's stronger, it's higher. Okay. So we so let's introduce the polaron concept. I think you know the so someone you already know this polaron. So for instance, in array like you know the single crystal, we have the free electron. But the polaron is a cloud, a phonon cluster, a cloud of phonon. So when the electron move, it just drag the light haze, okay? And the light haze shape or moving. Can you see, see light? Okay. So that's the physics, okay? So but for the, for the, uh, uh, this MA light iodide, which is one type, MA is organic molecules. And you can think about this MA is larger molecules. When it's moving around like a big chicken in the cage, they shake the cage. Okay. And this is a small polaron effect. Okay. But for the optical phonon, the light haze doesn't change really much. Okay. And uh, you can think about this is still chicken, but a small chicken, when they move around, it doesn't shake the cage. Okay? That's the fundamental difference between the cesium light iodide, this is small cesium, compared to the other inorganic or organic scatter material. Okay, cool. So, and uh, so, that's the work of our uh, quantum dots work. And, uh, Let's take a look at how this is related to the real solar cell. And uh, uh, before I move to Brock University, we make uh, around like 20% uh, uh, pro-scattered solar cell, cesium light iodide based. Uh, it's solution processed, really simple. And it's been coating and then do the different layer deposition, top contact, and you make this 20%. Uh, small devices. Uh, you can see this is a standard IV curve for measurement to indicate the, the VOC, which is open circuit, just short circuit, you know, the characterization. And here is the external quantum efficiency, which is the depend on the different wavelengths, one photon, how many electrons are generated. Okay, that's a standard that the uh, solid cell characterization. But the main challenge in the field for the solid cell is uh, we have this device, okay? Have this P-type, N-type solar cell structure, uh, hydrojunction, and we have the, the substrate, anode, the cathode, and under the sun illumination. So when people understand the carrier lifetime, they do the 
optical measurement, which is time result the photoluminescence. Okay, they cannot do the stack of the layer. They only take the perovskite material out and they measure the carrier lifetime. Okay, it's not in situ measurement, but they. This is a standard procedure for the proscite material or solar cell field. They always use this uh, optical approach to measure the carrier lifetime. Okay. The longer lifetime they claim, the higher solar cell efficiency. But it's not true. <laughs> so, but for us, we can incorporate this technique into the solar cell. We can directly measure the photocurrent. We can measure the, uh, the carrier lifetime, and also we can calculate the carrier mobility, defect concentration. You can see the time resolution for the initial peak inside, which is under 50 picosecond. Okay, that's a technical, uh, technical advantage for this technique. So we, we, we done different uh, proscite material, solar cell. This is the SEM for the quantum dust solar cell, and this is the cross section structure SEM. You can see, you know, the, it's only a couple hundred nanometer thickness, thin film solar cell, really thin. Uh, pretty much all the stuff over here, this is ITO. The real th film thickness is uh, uh, around a couple hundred nanometer. That's it. Yeah. So we make the solar cell devices make a comparison between the thick devices, thin film, uh, uh, the thinner devices. The interesting thing is uh, thicker devices uh, is 19%, and uh, thin, uh, thinner one is 23%, right? So the, the cool thing is the, for the thicker devices, the photocurrent peak, this is under the different electrical field. For, for the same electrical field bias, we have for uh, they are triple, almost triple, see? But lifetime for thinner, for sure, shorter, right? But the combination is uh, thinner devices, uh, higher efficiency. Make sense? Because the carrier lifetime even shorter, but the photo current higher, triple higher, okay? So let's say, you know, the, uh, so let's say it's a zoom in, Ultra fast photocurrent uh, measurement. This is ongoing project. We are still working on it, but I show you some preliminary data. So we can use this technique easily to identify the carrier transport, the dynamics, the different layer, and the device structure, the thickness, and so on. Yeah. So we also done the uh, temperature dependence to identify the uh, to identify the carrier transport. Uh, forgive me, this is a preliminary data. It's ongoing project. It's not published yet. We are still want to understand the, the decay curve. Actually, we want to model this, use the rate equation when turn out is really challenging, actually. So, but at least I give you some idea, rough idea first. So you can see the high temperature and the low temperature. High temperature, uh, you can see this one, even we normalize this, okay? So first, you can see the high temperature, the photocurrent higher than the low temperature. This indicates the carrier already when we excited the, the carrier, they already fall into the defects states. And then they moving out at high temperature, they can take out from the shallow defects, okay? But not the low temperature. Low temperature, they just trapped over there, shorter lifetime, okay? And if we normalize, this, you can see a clearly change under the high temperature and the low temperature. You can see the, the decay. Low temperature, faster decay, high temperature, slow decay. And more interesting thing is if we have the peak, we have the peak A, we have, if we pick up, you know, the point over here, fair comparison, and uh, over here B, you can see the ratio between the PA to PB. So indicate, let's say it's the higher ratio in, indicate once the carrier falls into shallow, tra shallow traps at a high temperature, it release again contribute the photocurrent, okay? That's the dynamics, uh, uh, but it's not done yet, okay? Yeah, more physics over there. 
Uh, so I want to conclude my talk by uh, giving you the impression human beings are really short lifetime. Okay. So from we born until we die, think about the optimum of 100 years. So we condense this 100 years one single unit, unit one. They say it's 10 to 3200 years, 10 to power 3200 years, the proton lifetime. Okay. <laughs> proton. So we knew the item. Item, the size is angstrom, right? The proton size, proton the size is 10 million smaller than the item size. So the nature teach us ultra small, but can be ultra long lifetime. And the human being is visible size, but it's ultra short, ultra fast. Okay. Uh, so that's my students, a couple PhD and uh, undergraduate students. Uh, I work with, uh, still work with NREL, Los Alamos, and the Berkeley people. Uh, with collaborator from Brown, Purdue University, and also industry. And uh, here is the funding agency, including the NSERC and the Brock University internal grant. Yeah. So I'm open to any questions. <laughs> Possibly I talk too, too fast. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. the slide where you, the quantum dots get populated like a ladder and then you slow down the, the minimalization but how do you extract the extra energy out of the solar cell how do you oh. harvest that uh, so we basically before it slow down before it you know the goes to the conduction band we take it out good question good question and uh, there is only one group uh, doing this, which is, so if you take a look at uh, uh, solar cell structure, okay, we call it hot carrier buffer layer or hot carrier contact. So if we have a direct contact with this quantum dots, this is, uh, 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 you, you make a direct thermalization with the contact, they lose energy right away, right? So the traditional way or the new way doing this, we introduce a layer, buffer layer, which only allow the excited state tunneling to the contact. Make sense for you? This is called hot carrier contact. Only one group doing this is in Australia, uh, Martin Green group, uh, subgroup doing this called carrier concept. But I don't think uh, many people in the United States or Canada doing this because it's ultra fast must be ultra fast and really hard to understand, to study actually, yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Nice talk. Show the um, slide where you can change the shape of these quantum dots, right? You can make yeah. spheres, you can make squares, yeah. you can make the rectangles. Yeah, 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 so, tetrapod. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great question. Great question. So, this is a fundamental topic to see the carrier transport between two sphere, which has a, a really point-to-point -point interaction to another uh, 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 shape, which is a cube, which is face-to-face -face interaction. There is nobody understand this yet. This is an unknown question, but carrier transport between the uh, 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 one one thousand two hundred one. This most likely is a tunneling transport, but the shape, the structure, how it affect the carrier transport is a no question. If we understand this, it can be easily published a Nature Family paper. Okay, <laughs> it's also ultra fast time scale transport. Okay, yeah, great question. Yeah. Can I ask a question about oh. the size of the solar cell? 
So once I check the, the annual um, web page and they publish their best solar cell, but they, they also tell what is the size of the cell. Really good. Yeah. yeah. So when I look at the silicon, it will be all the centimeters of yeah. their size. Yeah. And I look at the peroscope, so yeah. it's only 100 millimeters per size <laughs> cell. So first question is, why is such a drastic difference between the two communities? And yeah. Second, when you report your uh, efficiencies, what is the size? Really good question. Again, yeah. Uh, so I can give you a really super clear question. And uh, so when they certify the solar cell devices, uh, they try and play the trick. <laughs> Smaller size always give a higher efficiency. For instance, the quantum loss solar cell or proscite solar cell, they have a smaller size, normally it's a millimeter square or a couple millimeter light satellite. Okay. For instance, the tight sergeant group, when they certified only three millimeter or five millimeter under light satellite. But for silicon technology, which already well established, we're trying to make panel bigger. So the general trend is if we increase the size, or inter increase the size from the small scale lab size to the large panel, the efficiency for sure it will drop. For instance, the pros guide solar cell, at now, nowadays the record, the large panel, one to one, one meter to, uh, to one, by one meter, is around like 21 or 22 percent. But if you pick up a small size, it might be 26 percent. Make sense for you? So, but when you take a look at Unreal chart, they specific tell you roughly the size. Gave you, you know, the idea. And the people in the PV community, they, we all knew small size gave the higher efficiency because the edge effect. They say it's induced, the larger area induced the high recombination and the efficiency lower. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> so in your... Oh, in my case, it's uh, uh, five millimeter, roughly, yeah. Yeah, it's a small, uh, it's, it's a small size. I wouldn't claim, you know, to have a high efficiency because we want to understand the photophysics, not, you know, to make the, uh, it's, it's uh, eventually make a highly efficient the solar cell, but it's not, I'm, I don't do the solar cell efficiency, I do the fundamental understanding. <laughs> cool, thank you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who enable to extract the hot carrier? We need to put a buffer layer between the quantum dots to the contact. Because uh, imagine you know the the hot carrier can be easily thermalized, release the energy to the contact. Make sense? So we need to put a a single elect uh, energy level. Let's like say, you know, the another quantum material which has the single energy and the electron can tunnel in through laser. No, it doesn't matter. We collect it. For the, for, they already released the thermal energy. They already decay to the bandite. They already shake the lattice as the phonon, release the energy, right? <laughs> so, the lifetime, the lifetime in the silicon is longer, let's say a couple nanoseconds before it recombination by emitting light, we already take it out. Make sense? <laughs> cool. Cool. Go ahead. So I was wondering about the role of quantums in quantum paper optics. Uh, you show some images of films. Can you comment on the role of the interface quantum? Uh, uh, actually, the answer I don't know because we didn't study the interface. So this study is only the it's not the, the solar cell devices. It's the we have this co-planner which has the contact and then the uh, quantum dots material right between. So we didn't do the. Uh, solar cell structure, we don't know the interface between the whole transporter layer to the quantum dots, but uh, this, this uh, is the, this, uh, uh, 
But uh, they say it's the real solar cell devices data. Okay. Yeah. So, but great question. But this one you can see. Uh, over here, you can see this is tribe dominated. It's nothing related to the optical phonon. This one, this carrier transport. So in this material, this is all carrier already fall into the defects states. Okay, seism light eye die. Okay. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah.